The VT1 automatic transmission fitted to the Metro 1.4 is a compact and efficient unit designed to enhance and add flexibility to the excellent Metro range. Unlike more conventional automatic gearboxes that provide a limited number of gear ratio changes, usually three or four, the VT1 automatically and continuously varies the gear ratio to make sure you're always driving in the right gear. It achieves this using a unique fixed-length steel drive belt and two adjustable V-shaped pulleys. A primary pulley, driven by the engine, is connected by the belt to a secondary pulley, which drives the wheels. Both pulleys have a fixed half and a mobile half. Each mobile half is splined to the shaft and attached to a hydraulic piston, which can move it towards or away from its fixed half. When the mobile half is away from its fixed half, the belt is allowed to sit into the pulley and follows a small radius. As it moves closer, the belt is forced towards the outside of the pulley and follows a larger radius. The mobile halves are diagonally opposed, so when the belt radius is increased on the primary pulley, it's reduced on the secondary pulley, and vice versa. It's this belt movement which controls the gear ratio, and determines the relationship between engine speed and vehicle speed. It's interesting to note that the steel drive belt is pushed rather than pulled, forcing the belt to transmit drive to the secondary pulley in compression and not in tension. A low gear is required for pulling away. To provide this, the belt is allowed to sit into the primary pulley and forced to run around the outside of the secondary pulley. As the vehicle speed increases, a higher gear will be supplied. To provide this, the mobile half of the primary pulley is pushed towards its fixed partner, forcing the belt to follow a larger radius. To provide the highest or overdrive gear, the mobile half is moved right up to its fixed half, while the secondary pulley halves are moved farthest apart. In this condition, the secondary pulley rotates approximately two and a half times the speed of the primary pulley. Driving a vehicle with a VT1 transmission will initially feel unfamiliar as there's no fixed connection between the engine speed and the vehicle speed. The selector lever has five available positions park, reverse, neutral, drive and low. Free movement of the lever is restricted to move to and from park and from neutral to reverse, you have to release the selector lock by lifting the lever on the underside of the handle. A starter inhibitor switch is fitted to the transmission to monitor gear lever position and is used to ensure the engine will not start when a drive mode is selected. This switch also informs the engine management ECU of drive mode selection to ensure accurate engine speed control is achieved and the possibility of engine stall due to transmission load is eliminated. Park or P locks the transmission and must only be engaged when the vehicle is stationary with the handbrake applied. Selection of reverse or R simply provides reverse drive in a low gear and is the only drive position where the VT1 doesn't vary the gear ratio. In the neutral or N position, there is no drive transmitted to the front wheels. It should be selected when the vehicle is stationary with the engine running. The drive or D position should be used for normal driving. As you accelerate, you'll notice an immediate increase in engine speed. You'll feel the vehicle speed catch up with the engine speed as the gear ratio continuously changes from a low gear through to a higher gear more suited to the particular throttle position and driving condition. Also noticeable is the lack of any definite gear change as you would experience on a conventional automatic gearbox. Here you'll find a smooth, stepless acceleration. The VT1 will provide an overdrive gear during cruising and light throttle conditions, continually varying the ratio as different conditions prevail. A kickdown facility is initiated by downward movement of the throttle pedal in the normal way. Forward drive is also provided in the low drive or L position, 
which when selected delays the gear ratio up changes until a higher engine speed is achieved. Increased engine braking is also offered in L, making it suitable for towing, hilly or more sporty driving conditions. Another point worth noting is that it's possible to achieve top speed in either D or L and change between them at any speed. With the engine at idle, the brakes released and either D or L selected, a certain amount of vehicle creep will occur. Creep in the reverse direction will happen when R is selected. You may also hear a characteristic gear noise in this position, which will be more noticeable when the transmission is new. It comes from an epicyclic gear train within the transmission and can be considered normal. Now, a few fundamental do's and don'ts. Always apply the handbrake before selecting park to avoid the possibility of damaging the parking pawl mechanism and make sure it's applied and either park or neutral is selected before attempting to start the engine. Always make sure the vehicle is stationary before selecting reverse, keeping the vehicle speed to a minimum when driving in this position. To maintain full control of the vehicle, always apply the foot brake before selecting neutral. Avoid selecting forward drive while the vehicle is reversing and ensure both foot and handbrake are applied when stationary with any drive gear engaged. Never select drive, low or reverse while the engine is running above its controlled idle speed. And finally, don't rev the engine while the vehicle is stationary with a drive position selected. If necessary, flat towing of the vehicle should be carried out with neutral selected and the ignition switch in position two. The towing distance must not exceed 30 miles at a speed no greater than 30 miles per hour. The VT1 is a transmission that always provides the right gear for the prevailing driving conditions, combining many of the advantages found in a manual gearbox with the convenience of an automatic, helping the vehicle deliver excellent performance and outstanding economy. Let's examine the operation of the VT1 in detail. To do this, we'll need to look closely at the internal components which make up this unique assembly. To show how the various mechanical elements relate to each other, we'll refer to this model. The transmission is composed from a number of components, and these can basically be divided into three main sections. The mechanical torque flow section, the hydraulic control system, and a third section consisting of the components which connect the transmission to the outside world. We'll firstly look at the mechanical torque flow components. But before we do, let's establish how the engine torque is supplied into the transmission. Unlike most conventional automatic transmissions, the VT1 does not use a torque converter to provide a coupling between the engine and the transmission. Instead, it uses a torsional damper. Although not strictly part of the transmission, it connects the engine crankshaft via the flywheel to the gearbox input shaft and ensures the input shaft is always driven at engine speed. So the engine torque enters through the input shaft, which rotates at engine speed. As it does so, it drives three pairs of planetary gears via the planet gear carrier. Let's look more closely at the epicyclic gear train. As you can see on this exposed model, the epicyclic gear train is composed of three main components. A set of planetary gears connected to the input shaft, a ring gear, and a sun wheel, which is part of the primary pulley. The direction in which the sun wheel rotates is controlled by engaging either the forward or reverse clutch. 
Both are multi-plate units, similar to those used in more conventional automatic transmissions, but with much greater capacity. With the forward clutch engaged, shown here in red, the input shaft is locked to the primary pulley, causing the whole gear train to rotate as one assembly. Now back to the rest of the drivetrain. The pulley drives the belt, which forces the secondary pulley to revolve. Here, the belt is sitting around the inner circumference of the primary pulley and riding around the outer circumference of the secondary pulley. This would give a low gear, just right for initial drive away. The unique steel drive belt is not adjustable and is designed to last for the life of the transmission. It's assembled from more than 300 stainless steel segments. All are formed in this shape to match the pulley cone angles of 11 degrees. The segments vary in thickness and are fitted randomly, a feature which helps minimize belt noise. Note the dimple and the hollow on the opposite side which helps to integrate each segment with its neighbor, helping to keep the belt composed when in compression. The blocks are aligned and guided by two steel bands, which are in turn comprised of ten thin steel straps. As we've just mentioned, the steel belt will transmit the drive to the secondary pulley, forcing it to rotate and in turn drive the pinion gear. This gear simply transfers the drive from the secondary pulley to the differential crown wheel. The final drive itself is a conventional unit providing output via the drive shafts to the wheels. If reverse drive is required, the forward clutch is released and the epicyclic ring gear is locked to the transmission casing by the reverse gear clutch, again shown here in red. Using our exposed gear train, we see that when the planetary gears are driven around the locked ring gear, the sun wheel is forced to rotate in the opposite direction, providing the desired reverse drive. The belt still transmits drive while in compression. However, it now pushes the secondary pulley in an anti-clockwise direction. So that's the mechanical torque flow section. But that's only part of the story. We'll now take a look at the two elements that make up the hydraulic control system, the oil pump and the hydraulic control unit. The oil pump is a gear type unit, capable of providing an oil pressure in excess of 40 bar. It's driven at engine speed by this drive shaft, which fits through the center of the hollow primary pulley assembly, connecting the pump to the input shaft. Transmission fluid is drawn from the sump through a filter to the pump and is then supplied under pressure for both lubrication purposes and for use in the hydraulic control unit. The hydraulic control unit is very similar in build and function to those you may have seen on other conventional automatic transmissions and is the brain of the system. It houses a number of valves which respond to signals it receives relating to selector lever position throttle opening, engine speed, primary pulley speed, and gear ratio. On the output side, it controls clutch engagement by supplying pressurized transmission fluid to either the forward or reverse clutch, regulating the degree of engagement to ensure good drivability. It also regulates the amount of fluid pressure supplied to the primary pulley mobile half, controlling the gear ratio while at the same time making sure the belt's held tightly enough by the secondary pulley to avoid slip occurring. This concludes our detailed insight into the VT1's operation. All metros fitted with the VT1 use the single cam 1.4 K8 engine. Both throttle body injection and a three-way closed loop catalyst system are standard. 
The power unit is retained by three engine mountings, one at each end securing it to the subframe, and a third securing the transmission casing to the underfloor, acting as a steady bar. At the front, you'll find the air oil cooler used to keep the transmission fluid at its optimum working temperature. Its feed and return run across the front of the vehicle behind the radiator to the transmission. New transmission fluid is entered down this filler tube, which also houses the dipstick. The kick-down cable enters the transmission adjacent to the tube and runs up over the cam cover, connecting to the throttle linkage. Attached to the main casing bolt, you'll find both the transmission lifting bracket and its identification tag, clearly visible and easy to read, showing its seven-digit serial number. To the rear is the speedometer cable, also easily accessible, as is its pinion housing. The MEMS ECU controls engine management. It's a system which intelligently adapts to the engine's characteristics to provide the best tune, quickly smoothing out any initial roughness that may be experienced during the running-in period. Underneath the vehicle, behind the sump, screwed into the transmission casing, is the starter inhibitor switch. The drive shafts are retained to the final drive using the familiar spring ring method and are sealed by conventional oil seals. Neither shaft is interchangeable with those used on a vehicle fitted with a manual transmission. The selector cable is located adjacent to the exhaust and is protected from the very high temperatures by a heat-resistant sheath. We'll now examine the VT1's service requirements, adjustments, fault diagnosis trails and the repairs permitted during phase one restriction. All are detailed in the repair manual, which should always be referred to for guidance. First, we'll cover the transmission oil level checking procedure, an operation of real importance on the VT1. The transmission fluid plays a big part in making sure the VT1 operates properly so it's important that its level is regularly checked and maintained. The oil should be replaced at every 24,000 mile service. Unipart Shoreflow CVT fluid is the only oil to be used when refilling, although any Dexron 2 automatic transmission fluid can be used in an emergency when topping up only is required. Always check that the oil level is at least to the lower mark of the dipstick before carrying out this procedure. Then ensure the transmission is at its normal operating temperature by driving the vehicle for at least four miles. Park the vehicle on a flat and level surface and apply both hand and foot brake. With the engine at normal idle speed, move the selector lever through all positions three times. This will ensure the hydraulic control unit is fully primed and avoid a false level being indicated. With the handbrake still applied, select park and allow the engine to idle for one minute. Wipe away any dirt from around the dipstick cap before removing the dipstick. This will prevent dirt from entering the transmission. Clean it with a suitable lint-free cloth. Replace it fully into the filler tube, withdraw and check the oil level is to the maximum mark indicated by this upper notch. If you find the level is low, topping up to the maximum mark will be necessary. With the engine stopped, pour the new gearbox oil slowly down the filler tube, taking care not to overfill the transmission. 0.5 litres of oil will lift the level from the minimum to the maximum mark. Use this as a guide to estimate the amount of oil needed when topping up. And remember, if you find a low level, make sure the cause is accurately diagnosed before topping up. In service, adjustments to the VT1 are limited. We'll now run through the correct procedures to be used when adjusting the throttle, kickdown and selector cables. It's important to get these right, as incorrect adjustment may result in less than acceptable performance, and in extreme cases, transmission damage. Incorrect engine tune will also result in poor performance, so must be checked and adjusted, if necessary, before cable adjustment is undertaken. 
a combined procedure is used to adjust the throttle and kickdown cables. First, remove the air cleaner and disconnect the injector harness. To index the stepper motor, prior to making any adjustments, turn the ignition on. Wait five seconds, then turn the ignition off and wait a further five seconds. The stepper motor pin should now be in the normal idle position. Adjust the throttle cable to lose all lost motion movement. In this condition, the cable should be just taut and the pointer on the lost motion lever should align above the indicator on the throttle lever. Adjust the kickdown cable to give a 9mm gap between the crimp and the end of the adjuster. Slacken the throttle cable until the crimp just contacts the outer cable. You'll notice the lost motion link lever pointer now aligns below the indicator. Tighten the nuts securing the kickdown cable and finally adjust the throttle cable so that the pointer aligns with the indicator. Reconnect the injector wiring and refit the air cleaner. Now to the adjustment procedure for the selector cable. First, select park, then carefully slacken the nut retaining the selector cable to the transmission gear lever. Make sure both the gear selector lever and the transmission gear lever are in the park position, checking that free movement of the front wheels is restricted by engagement of the parking pull mechanism, then carefully re-torque. Finally, check the gear selector lever moves freely through all positions and that the engine will only start in park and neutral. When investigating faults on the VT1, always make sure you correctly identify the exact nature of the owner's complaint and gain the necessary authority from the service action desk before undertaking any repair work. Good afternoon. As we've already mentioned, the VT1 will only operate properly when the oil level, cable adjustments and engine tune are correctly set. It's recommended these adjustments be checked and the vehicle retested in the event of a complaint, unless the transmission is suffering with an obvious oil leak or mechanical problem. When checking the oil level on a suspect transmission, have a look at the condition of the oil. It should be red in colour and free of contaminants. In cases where the fluid is found to be contaminated with metallic particles, it's possible that a replacement transmission will be required. And remember, if you do change the transmission, always flush the oil cooler and its pipework to avoid contaminating the new box. If you find the oil has changed colour, is contaminated with water or other deposits, or smells burnt, serious transmission damage may have occurred but before condemning the VT1, replace the transmission fluid and drive the vehicle for at least 10 miles using all selector positions at least once before retesting the vehicle to see if the fault still exists. In cases where the symptoms do not change, consult with the service action desk before you replace the transmission. The starter inhibitor switch can be checked using an ohm meter. With the engine stopped, disconnect the inhibitor switch wiring. Connect the tester probes to terminals 1 and 2 on the switch, then move the selector lever through all positions. You should record continuity in the reverse position only. Next, connect one of the test probes to terminal 3, the other to the transmission casing. Again, move the selector lever through all its positions. Now continuity should exist only in park and neutral. Continuity should not exist between any other combination of inhibitor switch pins in any other selector position. Replace the switch and retest if you identify a problem. Two additional mobile tests can be carried out on the VT1. One is used to check the kickdown operation the other to ensure the downshift response is OK. It's recommended an accurate tachometer be fitted when carrying out these tests, although in this demonstration we'll show engine speed using the vehicle's rev counter. To ensure the kickdown operation is satisfactory, select Drive 
and accelerated the vehicle up to 50 miles per hour. Release the throttle and without using the brakes, allow the vehicle to decelerate to 38 miles per hour. Apply kick down at that moment by fully depressing the throttle pedal. If the engine speed is 3,800 to 4,200 revs per minute within one to two seconds, the kick down is okay. The second check is used to establish if the manual downshift response is okay. Again, with drive selected, drive at a steady 50 miles per hour. Release the throttle, then move the gear selector lever to low. If when the selector lever is moved, a positive deceleration is felt and the engine speed increases to between 3,500 and 4,000 revs per minute within one or two seconds, manual downshift response is satisfactory. If the selector cable is correctly adjusted and the transmission still suffers the complaint, renew the transmission. Repairs to the VT1 are basically restricted to rectifying oil leaks, replacing external components and replacing the gearbox. We'll now demonstrate the remove and refit procedure, highlight the care points to be observed during this operation and demonstrate some of the repairs permitted during phase one. With the bonnet removed and the battery disconnected, drain the engine coolant and remove both the top and bottom hose connections from the engine. The speedometer cable is easily released from its pinion housing by removing its rubber retaining pin. A large O-ring seal is used to seal the housing to the casing. When refitting the housing assembly, make sure it's clean. Replace the O-ring and push the pinion fully home to avoid the possibility of it dropping into the transmission. The dipstick and tube are also items that can be replaced. The tube is sealed to the transmission casing by a rubber O-ring. With the forward flywheel cover removed, the three bolts securing the starter motor can be unscrewed and the motor removed. The lower bolt is longer than the other two and has an earth connection attached to it which must be released before removal. It's not possible to remove the kickdown cable without first removing the starter motor. The sump gasket can also be replaced during phase one. Drain the transmission fluid into a suitable container and check the magnetic drain plug for metallic particles. And remember, if you're replacing the transmission fluid as part of a fault diagnosis trail, inspect the fluid condition and retain a small amount in a clean container in case further analysis of the oil is requested by the action desk. Raise and support the front of the vehicle and remove the left-hand front wheel and splash shield to gain access to the rear sump bolts. The rear of the transmission is also exposed with the splash shield removed. The primary cover, secured by three bolts, can be replaced if damaged. However, its O-ring must not be disturbed. If it's damaged or leaking, a replacement transmission will be required. The copper sealing washers, oil seals and O-rings used to seal all other phase one components must be replaced if a component is disturbed during a repair. To provide enough clearance between the sump pan and the subframe to allow the sump to be removed, the power unit must be lifted. Remove the battery and horn. Unclip the harness and remove the battery tray. Support the engine from above with a suitable hoist using special tool 18G 1572 or from underneath using a trolley jack, taking care not to damage the engine sump. Remove the two bolts securing the left-hand engine mounting to the support buttress and raise the unit. Disconnect the kickdown cable from the throttle body. The oil strainer is retained by a single screw and sealed to the hydraulic control unit by an O-ring, which again should be renewed each time the strainer is refitted. Rotate the pulley to expose the kickdown cable connection. Hold the pulley in this position and release the inner cable. Special tool 18G 1650 must be used to release the cable from the transmission casing.
When replacing the cable, first secure the outer cable into the casing. Refit the inner cable and then release the pulley. Always use a new gasket when refitting the sump, ensuring that the gasket surfaces and sump pan are clean and free from contaminants. Loosely refit all 13 bolts. then re -talk following the tightening sequence outlined in the repair manual. A new sealing washer should always be used when replacing the drain plug, which should be carefully re-tightened to the specified torque. Continuing with the removal procedure, release the exhaust downpipe and unscrew and plug the two oil cooler connections. Disconnect the starter inhibitor switch, which is sealed to the transmission casing by an O-ring. The switch simply screws into the casing and can be removed using a 19mm ring spanner or deep socket. Avoid using an open-ended spanner, which could damage the switch casing. Make sure the threads are clean and dry, and a new O-ring is fitted before carefully retorquing. Always use the correct O-ring and never use additional sealing washers or sealing liquids as incorrect switch operation may result. Continuing with the removal procedure, release both inboard drive shaft joints, taking care to lever away from the inhibitor switch when releasing the left hand joint. Remove the two lower bolts securing the engine to the transmission. Slacken the selector cable trunnion nut. Release the steady bar and bracket and withdraw the cable. Unscrew the three bolts and remove the lower flywheel cover. To replace the selector shaft oil seal, the selector lever must first be removed. Carefully lever out the old seal using a screwdriver and check the shaft and casing for damage. Drift in a new seal using a suitable socket to prevent seal distortion. Continuing with the removal procedure, remove and tie the brake caliper aside. Lift the hub. And fit a suitable spacer between the upper arm and the subframe. Remove the lower ball joint bolt and release the steering arm and the upper ball joint using special tool 18G 1584. Lift the hub and drive shaft assembly clear. The procedure used to replace the differential oil seals is very similar to that used on vehicles fitted with a manual gearbox. Special tool 18G 134.15 should always be used when drifting in new seals. The left hand engine mounting and support buttress must be removed before access to the secondary cover is possible. With the battery and its tray removed, the bolts securing the support buttress to the subframe can be removed.
Undo the four bolts securing the secondary cover to the transmission casing and carefully withdraw the cover. It uses two rubber O-ring seals and a semi-hard non-metallic split seal. All three should be replaced when the cover is refitted. Replacement of the copper washers used to seal the three blanking plugs and the oil cooler pipe unions are also permitted under phase one, as is the replacement or resealing of the oil cooler pipes and the cooler itself. Continuing with the removal procedure, remove the rear flywheel cover and disconnect and release the oxygen sensor wiring. Release the single 30 amp output connection of the under bonnet fuse box. Unscrew the ECU bracket, release the oxygen sensor relay, disconnect the inertia switch and move the engine harness aside. Release and remove the coil. Raise the power unit. Support the transmission and remove the two upper transmission to engine bolts and release the transmission. The torsional damper is fixed to the flywheel by six bolts and is easily removed. Check for damaged or weak springs, cracks and spline condition before replacing. With the transmission on the bench, access to the input shaft seal is possible. Carefully remove using a suitable lever. Drift in the new seal using special tool 18G1509 to make sure it sits square in the casing and up against the abutment. The transmission refit operation is basically the reverse of the removal procedure. During the refit operation, care must be taken to correctly engage the transmission with the torsional damper and the drive shafts with the final drive. When refitting the selector lever, push it fully forward into the park position. Check park is engaged, then secure the trunnion nut. Adjust the kickdown cable using the procedure you've just seen, which is also detailed in the repair manual. Carefully refill the transmission with oil up to the maximum mark. Approximately 5.2 litres will be required for a dry fill. 4.5 litres for a service fill. Reset the clock and radio before road testing and rechecking and adjusting the fluid level. So, in summary, the VT1 automatic transmission varies the gear ratio, always providing the right gear to suit the driving conditions. We've seen how it achieves this using hydraulic pressure to control the position of two movable pulleys, how the drive is transmitted by the steel belt and how it controls the direction of drive. We've covered the checks and adjustments that need to be carried out and shown the various repairs permitted under Phase 1 policy. Above all, we've seen how the VT1 combines many of the advantages found only in a manual gearbox with the convenience of an automatic, providing effortless motoring and helping to keep the Rover Metro well ahead of the competition. A multiple choice quiz designed to test your knowledge of the VT1 transmission is enclosed with this video package, offering you the chance to win one of six superb sets of screwdrivers and an opportunity to increase your total number of ATP points. To qualify for both, the closing date for your completed answer sheets is May the 1st, 1992.